Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. This is the day our God has made. The Apostle Paul wrote, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. In these human words, God's voice is heard.
Would you please join me in the spirit of prayer? Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now, may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. What is the gospel? We hear about it a lot, and yet it's one of those words we hear so much without defining it, we sometimes aren't exactly clear what we're talking about. Some people might think, if you ask them what's the gospel, they would say, well, aren't there about four of them in, in the Bible somewhere? Aren't, aren't those part of the New Testament? And there are, uh, there is a genre of literature uh, called gospel, and, and that is true. There are four of them in our canon. But those gospels are stories proclaiming the gospel. So what is the gospel. I grew up hearing that the gospel was that Jesus would give you a get out of hell free card if you believe certain things about him. But I, that never really landed with me and I do not believe that the gospel is afterlife fire insurance. So what is the gospel? The gospel is good news. And as Bishop uh, 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 Carlton Pearson says, uh, I almost called him Charleston Heston, and that would have been very wrong. As, uh, <laughs> as Bishop Carlton Pearson says, the good news is that the bad news is wrong. So what is the gospel? What is this good news? Good news that was so good that people in the first century risked their lives for it. And in some corners of the world, some remote places are still, uh, it is dangerous to be a person of faith if your faith isn't the approved faith. And in some places, faith in the gospel is the unapproved faith. Contrary to propaganda, the U.S. is not such a place, but we'll get to that. The gospel, the gospel of the first century changed lives changed lives in a way that people were willing to risk their lives to share it so that more people would know about it and somehow benefit from it even though with those benefits came great risk and challenge and cost. The gospel that changed lives in the first century, the gospel that Jesus lived and preached is very simply this. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's the gospel. In the gospel of, of Mark, the oldest gospel, Mark tells us this. Jesus came to Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, now is the time. Here comes God's realm. Change your hearts and trust this good news. That's it. Now's the time. It's coming. It's here. It's at hand. It's in our hands. That's the good news. Now, Jesus would demonstrate this message by ministering to the sick, by affirming the dignity of the outcast, by helping broken people rebuild their lives, by embracing those whom society and religion had rejected. But behind it all was this simple phrase, the time is now. God's realm is at hand. Change your hearts and trust this good news. God is omnipresent all-inclusive, unconditional, never-ending love. And we are meant to shape our world to reflect what God is. And we can, and that's the good news. In God's realm, the forgotten and disadvantaged have their dignity restored. In God's realm, the poor are fed. In God's realm, the sick are tended. In God's realm, political prisoners are released. In God's realm, refugees find safety. In God's realm, violence is not acceptable. And in God's realm, all people are reminded that they have sacred value. That's Jesus' vision of God's realm. And the good news is that such a realm is in our hands. It's time for it. It's at hand if we do our part. Jesus says, trust that this heavenly vision of earthly possibility is ours to bring about. Now, those who gained influence or power or wealth by exploiting the poor or by waging war or by ignoring suffering, they didn't want to hear about a world where none of that is lauded. 
The last will be first. Turn the other cheek. Give to all who ask, feed the hungry, touch the untouchable, heal the sick. That's not how empires are built. That gospel is a direct challenge to all who aren't using a fair portion of their resources to make the world better for everyone. So the powers, the power keepers, the powers that be, the holders of power try to squash this Jesus thing, this seditious movement that is spitting in the face of empire and imperialism and colonization and slavery. It is standing up to all that is wrong and oppressive and unjust and saying God wants us to have a different kind of world. The power keepers do not want to hear that. They never have. They still don't. If it were about, and see, this is why it's seditious. This is why people are getting in trouble. This is why people are losing their lives. It's not, nobody is in jail because they think when they die, they'll go somewhere else. That's not why Paul is in prison. That is not why people are executed. That's not why people are hiding and worshiping in catacombs and in houses and underground. No, they are in hiding and they are, they are scared because they have threatened a power system. The systems of this world, the powers and principalities of this world, and the powers and principalities are fighting back to hold on to their power and privilege. It's not about, no one's in trouble because they believe in an afterlife. That would have been no threat at all. It wasn't about getting us to heaven. It was about challenging us to conquer every hell on earth and to do all that we can. <laughs> to do all that we can to challenge systems of oppression so that all people can thrive. I don't even worry about the afterlife. First of all, I've never been there I don't know, that I can remember, so I don't know anything about it. And I am convinced that God is a love that will not and cannot let us go. We don't have to earn God's favor and we cannot lose it. So now that we've settled that, let's get back to healing the world that God has entrusted to us. The gospel looks at what isn't right yet with the world and sees the good that is possible and then calls us to usher in that good. It is a call to action. Sometimes the church has behaved as if it should be inwardly focused, protecting what it has, holding on to, to what it's been, and, 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 and pleasing those who, who are keeping it all together right now. And as they are inwardly focused though, they have less and less influence beyond their walls. And that isn't the church. It may be a lovely club, but it isn't the church and it has nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel is outward focused. The gospel challenges oppression. The gospel says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will refresh you. The gospel is about inclusion. The gospel is about healing. The gospel is about justice. And when those things aren't happening, the gospel is about trying to make them happen. And when people feel threatened by that, here's what they'll say. I don't want to hear any of that in church. That sounds political. Well, I hope all political parties are, are on board with this. I hope everybody, political or not, wants the world to be better. And whether that is political or not, it is the gospel. I don't want to hear about all that. I just want to hear about the Bible. Then you want to hear about slavery, slaves standing up to Pharaoh and walking out. Well, they shouldn't have been political like that. But they stood up for justice. If you, I don't want to hear about all that social stuff. I want to hear about Jesus. You mean Jesus who as a child was a refugee in Egypt? Thank God they let him in. I don't hear about all that. I don't hear about the Bible. You don't want to hear nothing about the Bible, I promise. If you don't want to hear about justice and hope and healing and change, you are not ready for the Bible. gospel looks at what isn't right yet with the world and calls us to usher in the positive change. Not a home in glory land, not the sweet by and by, but peace on earth, goodwill toward humankind. That's the gospel and it strikes fear through the halls of power to this day and it even makes the church uncomfortable to be honest. But Paul has been transformed by the gospel message. It changed him, and he dedicated his life to sharing the message of God's kingdom over against Caesar's empire. And so now, Paul is in prison for it. Not for telling people that there was a mansion just over the hilltop. That's not why he's in prison. 
He's in prison because he is talking about a gospel vision of what the world could be. And in the world that God wants, there is no Caesar. And so he's challenging power and privilege. He's challenging a world where oppression and marginalization are rampant. And he's saying the good news is that God wants us to have a different kind of world and we can start building it now. That's revolutionary. And that is why Paul is on lockdown. And from prison, Paul continues to share good news. He's not going to let prison keep him from sharing. If I can't get to places to talk, if I can't get to people to visit with them, if I can't go on a journey, I'll write letters and have them read in our communities here and there. This letter he's writing to the Philippians. And so he continues sharing good news. He can't be intimidated. He can't be stopped. He can't be bullied into not sharing good news of what can be. Later, someone writing in Paul's name says, you can chain me, but there is no chaining the word of God. What plucky Paul is saying is, do your worst, that shows who you are. But you don't have what it takes to make me give up the vision of a world built on God's justice love. So Paul just keeps sharing. He'll write it if he has to. He'll do it one-on-one -on -one if he has to. He'll take trips as he, if he has to. He will endure imprisonment and stoning and being run out of town. But he can't be stopped. The power keepers are trying to shut this thing down. This thing that says that everyone has dignity and worth. This thing that says there's a way of forming community that affirms the sacred value of all people. And Paul says, look, my friends, my Philippian friends, the power keepers don't want this message getting out. But the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion. If we will hold on to the gospel vision and be committed to it, it's going to happen. We, we don't know when the world is going to look like it's supposed to look, but we know that we won't stop until it does, and God will see us through. God has given us the gospel vision, but we are the laborers in the vineyard to bring it about. What God does for us, God does through us. The kingdom is in our hands. The good news that Paul is sharing is so good, it excites him. It, 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 it encourages him. While he's giving people hope, he finds his own reserves of hope replenished. And now he can share even more hope with others. While he's telling people, I, I just want you overflowing with love, and I have the compassion of Jesus Christ for you, and, and just keep going. God's going to help you see it through. The one who began this good work will see it through to completion. And he gets so filled with hope, he applies it to himself. He gets excited. He gets blessed. He, he, finds, he goes to peace instead of to pieces right there in the jail cell. And so he just keeps writing. You know, what what has happened to me has actually helped spread the gospel it has become well known that my imprisonment is for Christ for this vision of God's kingdom that Jesus preached that I am in prison for Christ and the message of Christ and the community of Christ so others have been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment and now they are daring to speak out more boldly because I wouldn't let them shut me up, because I wouldn't run and I wouldn't fight and I wouldn't stop. And, and what can you do with a person like that? More people are stepping up saying, I want to be that kind of voice for healing and hope and justice in the world. Now, of course, he's not thrilled about being in jail, but he sees that his boldness has given others courage to be bold. His, endu his endurance has, has helped others face their challenges for their commitment to the cause of Christ in ushering in God's kingdom, God's counterculture. And so even in jail, Paul has chosen to see the blessings that have come in spite of, or maybe even because of his experience. He sees the good, at least he sees the good that is possible. That's the power of the gospel. Looking at brokenness and woundedness and injury and saying that's not the end of the story. There's something good that can come out of this. There is healing that can happen for this. Even when there is loss, there is something left. Even when there is failure, there is something learned. If we can see the good, we can make that our focus and then bring about more good. There's a Buddhist saying, the lotus flower that blooms in the mud the lotus is a flower. It blooms in the mud. <laughs> Thich Nhat Hanh says, no, no mud, no lotus. The lotus is a flower that blooms in the mud. The thicker the mud, the more beautiful the flower. Even when the world seems ugly, beauty can be brought forth. That's the gospel. That's the kingdom of God at hand. In our world right now, there's a lot of ugliness. 
the president of a seminary in Texas, has counseled women in abusive marriages to stay in those unsafe situations, and he has no remorse for it. That isn't the gospel. That kind of cruelty is precisely what the gospel calls us to confront. When a woman was about to be stoned by men for the act of adultery, now, there are things, there are, there, there, are, there, there are pleasurable things one can do by oneself, but it's not called adultery. So if this, she's caught in adultery, she was caught in adultery with someone. Why is she the one and only one with rocks being tossed at her, right? And so Jesus intervenes and calls them hypocrites and saves her. He didn't say, you know what, you broke the rules, just pray through it, let them throw the rocks, maybe an angel will spare you. That's not the gospel. That's BS. And here, this, this president of a large evangelical seminary, and it was a few years ago, but all these years later, he refuses to say that he said anything out of order. He said, just stay in your marriage. Pray about it. God will, God will fix it. And one woman that he told that to came to church the next day with two black eyes. And she, challenging him, said, are you happy with your advice now? And he said, yes, I am, because I see that your husband came with you, and so he's going to repent, he's going to get saved. Oh, God is using all of this for good. I have no doubt that he at least wanted to believe that, but I refuse to accept that any of that is the gospel. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Unrepentant and often violent demonstrations of racism are increasing. And listen, there is an attack on LGBTQ people being launched blasphemously and mendaciously in the name of religious liberty. They aren't trying to gain freedom to worship as they please. They have that. We all have that. What they want is for their brand of religion to marginalize, demonize, and dehumanize queer people and limit women's personal choices. They may or may not get away with it, but in either case, they will not have the gift of my silence. The gospel compels us to resist tyranny. Sunshine Cathedral, we are being called today to embrace the gospel vision and get back to work. Times are tough right now, but the Roman Empire of the first century was worse. And in that even more hostile environment, Jesus and Paul and the early church risked everything to lift up a vision of what the world could be, a world that offered hope and dignity and security to every person. We aren't there yet. But the vision and the work to fulfill it are still in our hands. And this is the good news. Amen. You will do amazing things With the choice each new day brings And with every step you Bless the progress that you make, the reason you're here is found in every gift you give. Love your life, love your dreams, you will do No need 
to look ahead or back. Just enjoy what this day brings. You will do amazing things. partake in this communal meal, this sacred meal, we remember that on the night of his betrayal and arrest, Jesus had gathered with his friends, with his family, with his family of choice for a Passover meal. And during that meal, Jesus took a piece of leftover bread from the table and he blessed it and he broke it. And he offered it to all of them, saying, take and eat of this bread. And know that when you are hurting, when you feel broken yourselves, you can eat of this bread and remember me. And at the end of the supper, Jesus took a cup from the table. Because this was a Passover meal, a place would have been set for the prophet Elijah. <coughs> Would this be the night, the time, the place that the prophet would return? But Jesus took Elijah's cup as if to say, let's not wait for the prophet, but let each of us be that prophetic voice that offers hope, that offers healing. He told them, when you drink from this cup, drink deeply. Let its message of love and of compassion fill you and remember me. My friends, it is your presence here this morning that is the prayer that blesses and sanctifies these elements of grape and of grain. And as we come into union with each other and with the divine, let each person here be reminded that we are called to share light. We are called to share love with a hungry, with a thirsty world. Amen. Amen. Here at the Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion. What that means is that you don't have to be a member of this church or of any church to receive this sacrament, just as you are. With whatever your beliefs or your doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. My dear friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. 